Welcome to Crime Stoppers. I'm your host, Chip Brown. Heartland Crime Stoppers is a community-based program designed to help law enforcement solve crime by providing a way for the public to phone in tips anonymously and receive cash rewards of up to $3,000 for information that leads to an arrest, the recovery of stolen property, or the recovery of illegal drugs. Heartland Crime Stoppers is funded through the State of Florida Office of the Attorney General, Crime Stoppers Trust Fund, and through donations from the community. Citizens and local businesses make Crime Stoppers work. On today's show, we will talk with Kurt Lockwood, Deputy Director of Polk County Sheriff's Office Communications Center, about their efforts to keep Polk County safe. But we open our show today with Deputy County Manager over Public Safety, Gary Hester. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chip. Good to be here. Now, you are a local grown product here at Polk County. Tell us about growing up in Haines City. Yes, sir. I was uh, born and raised in Haines City and attended public schools there. Uh, still live in that area today. Uh, I've had the, the privilege of serving at the Polk County Sheriff's Office where I started my career in 1979. Um, left there in 2010, retired uh, to take a uh, position as a police chief in the city of Winter Haven and uh, left there uh, about 20 months ago, 21 months ago, to uh, take on a new challenge as a deputy county manager uh, for public safety here with Polk County. It doesn't seem like it's been 20 months ago. Time certainly flies. It, I've been busy. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts uh, in the public safety world here in this large county, and uh, it's been a challenge, but at the same time, it's, it's also been rewarding to continue to serve uh, my fellow citizens. Now, you started in 79 as a, actual, as a detention deputy working in the jail. That's correct. Uh, now, what got you in the law enforcement bug? What made you decide to want to get into law enforcement? Yeah, you know, I always had an interest in uh, in, in public service and uh, public safety, and uh, and you know back in the day in Hang City, um, I attended church with uh, Chief Ken Kenneth Thompson, mm -hmm. affectionately known as Pinky Thompson, in the Hang City area. And uh, Chief Thompson, I uh, was friends with his son, and he was the police chief in Hang City, and he kind of encouraged me to to choose this profession, and. Uh, and uh, actually directed me to the sheriff's office. So I, I went there and applied and uh, I was fortunate enough for Sheriff uh, Louis Mims to hire me as an 18 year old kid right out of high school to go to work in the county jail. And I uh, had the pleasure of serving there for about a year. Uh, learned a lot in that year. Uh, and then had the opportunity to, to go on the road as a, as a patrol deputy. And uh, when I left there, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the chief of staff to Sheriff Grady Judd. Yeah. Now you also had a d other assignments between being a, a work in detention and being the chief of staff, uh, you did a number of other things. Can you just tell us briefly about some of those areas you worked in? Right, I, I served. Uh, you know, I served in the county jail, um, and then once I uh, become a road deputy, um, I served as a patrol deputy, and uh, mainly on the east side of the county, but also in the Winter Haven area, and um, uh, was one of the first five canine handlers uh, for the sheriff's office. Uh, we uh, we actually. Uh, uh, went through the uh, Canine Academy at Lakeland Police mm -hmm. Department. Uh, Ron Bowling was the instructor, mm -hmm. a well-known uh, canine uh, uh, trainer and mm -hmm. uh, professional. And uh, so I had the pleasure to serve there as a canine handler and then became a detective and served many years in the narcotics function um, and uh, was promoted up through the ranks, had the opportunity to serve as a patrol supervisor as well as a detective supervisor, um, lieutenant, captain, uh, major, and uh, and ultimately had the opportunity to serve as chief of staff. I, you know, I tell folks I was very fortunate that Sheriff Mims hired me. Uh, Sheriff Crow uh, promoted me five times, and uh, Sheriff Judd gave me the last promotion to chief of staff. And uh, so I, I had a very blessed career in, in law enforcement. And if not for the experience I had at the sheriff's office, I would have never had the opportunity to serve as the uh, police chief in Winter Haven. Yeah, certainly a lot of personal ability goes along with that being blessed as well. You have to use your talents and you have to uh, make a lot of hard decisions sometimes. Now, I know that uh, when you retired from the sheriff's office, you went over as the chief of police in Winter Haven. How was that jump? How did that uh, equate out? Uh, it, it was much different uh, in, in going into municipal policing as opposed to working for an elected sheriff, a, a constitutional office, uh, a large agency. Sheriff's office is certainly one of the largest and most uh, professional agencies in the country. Um, going to a, a medium medium sized police department certainly has its challenges. You have less staff, mm -hmm. but uh, but you have the same level of performance uh, that you have to produce mm -hmm. there with with less staff. So a lot of great people at Winter Haven. I enjoyed the time there. Uh, we had a, a very productive time. Mm -hmm. 
reduced crime over 25% in the four years and was able to you know, really invest in the staff. It's a great city, great community. Um, I certainly miss the folks at the Sheriff's Office and, and at Winter Haven, my, my colleagues there. Uh, but you know, this, this is a new challenge that I'm confronted with now. And, and you know, one of the important things I think many folks overlook is um, I got a young start in law enforcement, but law enforcement's changing and even more so today. And um, you, know, I, I, you can't underestimate the importance of education and seeking education, staying current, current in those fields. Uh, experience alone is not enough. You also have to be educated and, uh, and, and go to some of the best uh, command schools in the country. And, and fortunately under Sheriff Crow and Sheriff Judge leadership, they provided that opportunity for the men and women of the Sheriff's Office to seek some of the best training in the country. And uh, that certainly helped me as I transitioned to be a police chief. And, and certainly that leadership skills still help me today. So in the middle of all this stuff, as you're working for the sheriff's office, you were able to go to school part time and get your not only your AA degree, but also your bachelor's degree, correct? And, and, and my master's degree. And master's, uh, yes. Yes. So I, I was able to obtain all of my college uh, while going on the weekends and at night uh, and after hours. That was long before uh, the web base. Mm -hmm. uh, college courses that is available today, but yes, there's you know it takes a commitment not only on your part but also on your agency's part and your family's part. It's your a sacrifice for your business. family uh, when you're away uh, at school. But uh, but it was important, and uh, it certainly all of that you know I think has uh, has led to the opportunities that that I even have today uh, is based off the past and the support I've received from you know not only my family but also from the the two previous agencies I work for. Now tell us about your position now as the uh, deputy county uh, manager and you have a lot of different areas that you cover you're in charge of so tell us about that. Yeah I, I have the privilege of overseeing uh, the fire rescue uh, about five years six years ago the Polk County EMS and Polk County Fire Department was merged under Polk County Fire Rescue. Um, so I have the privilege of overseeing the, the fine and dedicated men and women that, uh, that work in that area. Uh, nearly 550 full-time members that work in that area. Uh, our EMS service, uh, AMLET service, is a county-wide service, so it's serving all uh, 600 and approximately 40,000 residents. And then our fire, uh, our fire commitment is to the unincorporated areas and a few of the municipalities who have uh, turned their fire protection over to the county fire, fire department. I also have the pleasure of overseeing the code enforcement uh, function within the county as well as uh, county probation and the emergency management functions which include a variety of things including things as, as basic as uh, our hurricane preparedness and, and being prepared for unusual occurrences uh, from an emergency management standpoint, but also the 911 addressing uh, that is the foundation of getting the first responders uh, to an address in this very large county, uh, as well as uh, our 800 radio system, uh, the network and support that's in place to keep our, our radio system up and functioning. As I refer to folks, it's like air. As long as you can breathe and it's there, no one seems to notice it, and that's kind of how the the radio system is. As long as you key the mic and it works, no one really thinks much about it. Uh, but it's a, uh, a 35 million dollar plus investment the county's made in ensuring that we have a radio system that can get our first responders uh, to our citizens in their in their time of need. And that's the whole goal of, of the radio system and and, the, and your function basically to oversee, make sure it's working, but get the information you know from people calling in to 911 or whichever line they call in on. Uh, because they all come through that central dispatch and they're all dispatched out and so having that information be able to go out and be accurate and to be quickly uh, to get to their the responders and to have uh, to know exactly where they're going and what they're going to see hopefully when they get there. Yeah and, and it's you know it's kind of unique here in Polk County um, the relationship was built between the Board of County Commissioners and the Sheriff um, you know back uh, many years ago where they consolidated the what was known as the county's communication center with the sheriff's dispatch center into what is known today as the emergency communication center. Um, the ECC is, uh, is, is, is a absolute nerve center of, of our public safety response in this county. Those folks handle a significant number of calls. They do a phenomenal job um, with that, but it is, it's consolidated uh, all of our response into one center um, with the exception of uh, 
a couple, I think three municipalities, all of the municipalities within the county is also dispatched out of that, that communication center. So it kind of makes it seamless, um, you know, where you have a fire dispatcher sitting next to a law enforcement dispatcher. Uh, they're able to share information in a real-time basis and, and that goal being to get the best help we can to the citizens as quickly as possible. So it's a, it's a really unique system here. Uh, we continue to work every day to try to improve that from, from our fire rescue side as well as the sheriff and his staff works from, from his side to try to, um, you know, to be the best that we can be in, in service to the citizens. Now, obviously, Polk County is growing. The populations uh, are coming in and moving around in the county. And having the staff available in important locations, key locations, to be able to respond to their needs is something that is very important to you and to the county manager. Yes, sir. It, it, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, we went through, as, as our citizens well know, they, they endured it. The, uh, the economic downturn that we all experienced in, in uh, 2007, 2008, um, you know, it's been a slow recovery and uh, the county lost a significant amount of revenue to support uh, our services. Uh, they've, you know, the board has worked hard to hold public safety harmless, uh, but frankly there hasn't been um, a lot of money to invest in enhancing or improving that service uh, since 08. Uh, over the last couple budget cycles, including the one that we will be headed into in October, the board has made significant investments in trying to, uh, you know, to, to increase our level of level of public safety service. This county's 2,020 square miles. Uh, as I stated earlier, we provide EMS service, uh, ambulance service, emergency ambulance service to all of our citizens countywide, both inside the city limits and in the unincorporated areas. Uh, our county continues to grow. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately 62% of our residents live in unincorporated Polk County. One of the fastest growing areas is that uh, North Ridge area, sometimes referred to as the Four Corners area. Mm -hmm. The northeast area of our county is growing at a rapid pace. And it, it's challenging to, uh, you know, to meet the needs of the emergency services in that area. But, uh, but we're, we're making plans for that. The board recently approved uh, us to move forward with uh, obtaining a master plan. Uh, for fire uh, stations in the future, fire rescue stations, that would be both for medic trucks as well as fire apparatuses uh, to, you know, to plan for the future. Uh, we have some current needs. Um, we currently have a station that uh, will begin construction in the South Point Santa area. We refer to it as our Lake Marion Creek Station. We'll start sometime in the next few months. Um, but we have a lot of challenges, but we have a lot of board support. We certainly have support from the county manager's office. Um, you know, to try to meet the demand for service uh, and serve our citizens at the level that they deserve and expect. Well, Gary, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know that the uh, county manager and the county commissioners are very glad to have you on staff helping them out. And as a citizen of Polk County, I thank you too. Thank you. I appreciate being here. And uh, it's certainly an honor and privilege to continue to serve uh, my fellow citizens here in Polk County. Crimes Topper provides a way for local law enforcement to receive information on crimes while keeping the people providing that information anonymous. These efforts increase tips, which in turn solve more crimes and identifies criminals in our community. Here's a look at some of our most recent cases. On June 10, 2016, the victim left a mini Apple iPad 3 in a black folding case at Walmart located at 7450 Cypress Gardens Boulevard in Winter Haven. The individual pictured was observed by surveillance video picking up the iPad 3 after the victim left and made no attempt to notify the owner or turn the item in to lost and found. The suspect pictured exited Walmart carrying the mini Apple iPad 3 with him and left the area in a silver gray four-door. 1996-97 Mercedes-Benz with damage to the front driver's side and dark tinted windows. Call Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-TIPS. That's 8477. You will remain anonymous and be eligible for a cash reward if your tip results in his arrest. On June 26, 2016, the victim responded to a flyer advertising air conditioning services, which was posted between Bates Street and U.S. Highway 1792 in Haines City. The suspect seen here told the victim he would replace the AC unit for $4,000 and asked him for the money up front. The victim paid the suspect 
$2,500 with a check. The suspect used the name Angel Ramos. If you recognize the suspect seen here or have any information about this fraud, please call Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-TIPS at 8477 or check them out on the web at heartlandcrimestoppers.com. Do you recognize either of these suspects? On Sunday, June 26, 2016, they used several different clone credit cards at a Walmart Supercenter located at 6745 North Church Avenue in Mulberry to purchase phone cards, gift cards, and merchandise. If you know who these suspects are, please contact Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-TIPS or go to heartlandcrimestoppers.com and leave an anonymous web tip. On June 1st, 2016, the victim was notified that his personal information was used to open two credit cards at Walmart at 355 Cypress Gardens Boulevard and Macy's at 231 City Center Street Southwest. The victim's personal information was also used in an attempt to open a credit card at Belk's department store located at 235 City Center Street Southwest. The subject was a passenger in the vehicle that seen. If you recognize the suspect, please call Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-8477 or click on the Give a Tip tab. A cash reward is available if your tip results in his arrest. The Lake Wales Police Department is attempting to identify this suspect who removed jewelry from a Walmart on July 23, 2016. The suspect then exited the store and fled in a green color four-door vehicle driven by an unknown subject. If you know who this is or recognize the vehicle, please call Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-TIPS where you can leave an anonymous tip and be eligible for a cash reward. On April 4th, 2016, these two females were observed shoplifting items from the Dollar General store in Lake Hamilton. If you recognize who they are, please call Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-TIP or click on the Give a Tip tab on our website or Facebook page. The Lake Wales Police Department is attempting to identify this subject who stole a cart full of groceries from Publix on Highway 60 in Lake Wales. If you know who this is, leave an anonymous tip with Heartland Crime Stoppers by calling 800-226-TIPS. If the tip results in an arrest, you will be eligible for a cash reward. On July 18th at approximately 10.45 p.m., an armed robbery occurred at the Zaxby's restaurant located at 35696 Highway 27 in Haines City. After removing all the money from the safe and the cash tills, the suspects fled the area on foot. Both suspects were wearing work gloves and covering their faces. Both suspects are described as black males in their early 20s, each of which had an unknown type handgun. One suspect carried a pink backpack. Now, anyone with information regarding this incident is urged to contact Heartland Crime Stoppers. You can do that by going to www.heartlandcrimestoppers.com and a cash reward is available if your tip results in an arrest. The Lake Wales Police Department is attempting to locate the pictured vehicle. On July 10th, 2016, the vehicle was reported stolen from a grove at Tangelo Street and Highway 60. If you have any information on the vehicle, please contact Heartland Crime Stoppers at 800-226-8477. Welcome back to Crime Stoppers. I'm your host, Chip Brown. We're here today in the Sheriff's Office Emergency Communication Center with Deputy Director Kurt Lockwood. Kirk, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to our center. Yeah. Now, this is quite a center here. That's, uh, golly, how many people do you have working in here? We have about 156 that work for me, um, that work here in the Emergency Communication Center, about 25 to 30 at a time on a shift. We have four different shifts that run 12 hours. 
that's a long time to be sitting behind a desk because uh, they hear all sorts of stuff and uh, they're tied to that desk. Once they get in there, they pretty much, unless somebody believes them, they're, they're stuck hearing all the stuff that goes on in society, don't they? Absolutely. Everything from delivering a baby to uh, calls of uh, domestic violence to uh, the worst, you know, shots fired, officer down. So they work all types of calls. Yeah, and they really learn the officers because they are part of a family and they can tell that inflection in the, in the deputy's voice that something is not right and uh, it is it's so hard. People don't understand the human aspect of, of these dispatchers and communicators. It's just a, a, a tough job and it takes a special person to do that. Yes, it does and I'd say it time and time again, but these are the true first responders. You know, not really law enforcement, fire, EMS. These are the ones that answer the call first and have to remain online. And most of the times after, you know, emergency personnel arrive on scene, they hang up so they don't know the outcome of the call. So it makes it a little bit more stressful uh, pertaining to that. Indeed. Now tell us about uh, the training that goes on to get before you're qualified because obviously you don't come in and they give you a book and say, okay, you're dispatching, knock yourself out. I mean, there is a long, drawn-out process and very intense. But tell us about that training. Well, of course, the application process just to get hired here is, you know, we're held at a very high standard here, so it's, it's difficult just to get hired on. But once they do, uh, the state of Florida now has initiated a certification program for all telecommunicators throughout the state of Florida. So they have to uh, take a state certification test, basically be certified just like a detention deputy or deputy sheriff. Uh, our classroom, everything we do on site in our own classroom, we train for over 240 hours just in the classroom phase. That's a lot of hours. Yes, sir. And once they complete that, and we give them all the tools they need, EFD certification, which is emergency fire dispatch and emergency medical dispatch, EMD certification. And uh, we bring them out here on the floor. They're one-on-one -on -one with the trainer. So they'll train for another, you know, 300 plus hours and they'll have daily training appraisals done on them every day. Uh, quality assurance reviews and we make sure they have all the tools they need before they're released to answer a call by themselves. And that's what's most difficult. They'll make it through training and answer that call by themselves and you know it's it's a lot different than having somebody sitting right next to you telling you what to do. So, uh, And again those calls could go up and down from a pothole in the road uh, to um, you know a domestic violence call to like I said shots fired off or down so they have to be prepared for each one. And um, Again, those calls, they don't have any time to think about it. they got to react immediately and get emergency personnel there on the scene. So it could be difficult. It could be stressful at times. Now, Kurt, besides the, the 911 calls that come in, the high-stress calls, uh, you get a lot of normal calls, non-emergency, and some are just really ask questions that have no business with law enforcement, like, you know, what time do the fireworks start, you know, coming up, or what time does the Christmas parade start? I mean. I'm sure you have a number of things that you can relate to in that. Yeah, there's been, a, over my time I've been here, there's been a number of calls that we've received that just don't require either a response from here or a 911 response. And it's simple things like I said, you know, how's the weather outside or, you know, what time are the fireworks yeah. coming on the start. But that's what we hope people will, you know, understand that and free up the lines here, especially dialing 911. If it's not a true emergency, don't dial 911. Dial our non-emergency number. Keep our 911 lines free because we want those emergency lines free for true emergencies. And yeah, we're going to help you regardless. Uh, but if we if we get a call that's not related to anything that's an emergency or a law enforcement response or a fire and EMS response, we're going to tell you sorry we we don't respond to that. And you know we'll politely hang up. You know and. Yeah. and now, when someone calls 911, obviously it comes directly in here, uh, and there's a number of protocols and questions that they have to ask, and many people don't understand that they are required by law on all 911 calls to dispatch a deputy to make sure they're okay, because sometimes people call 911 and can't tell you what's going on. Correct, and that's a lot of uh, problems with our, you know, accidental dials and things like that. Uh, it might be a true accidental dial, but we still have to send a deputy to you, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. We want to make sure that you're okay and it's not somebody that's in distress that can't tell us. Uh, and the 911 call will come in, we'll verify your, you know, your phone number, your address that you're calling from, and uh, we'll send that to a law enforcement call taker or fire an EMS call taker if it's a medical uh, call, and we'll dispatch something to you right away. And my call takers will also get information from me once that call is transferred to them. And just because they're asking you questions on the phone doesn't mean that somebody's not already on the way. They're trying to get as much information as possible so we can update <clears throat> the emergency responder that's coming to the call. Yeah, because the information they're giving to the deputy uh, is life-saving. It, it's it's so very important to him because they're looking up to see if there had been prior dispatches there, people with weapons there, somebody's been hurt Correct. there. 
they look at the call history and, and sometimes the people calling in don't understand why are you asking so many questions. Right. Uh, they know what they're trying to say, but getting it relayed to the first responder is so very important and it just, and the dispatcher gets caught in the middle. Correct. And our EMD and EFD protocols that we talked about before, emergency medical dispatch, emergency fire dispatch, depending on how you answer a question, that will tell my operators which, which car to go to next and which question to ask next. Yeah. And um, it makes them sound like a doctor sometimes, especially when you're delivering a baby. You know, you never know. So, or giving heart, you know, compressions, chest compressions, or whatever. So, yeah. now you talked about the protocols. You do have, when a, depending on the calls that comes in, uh, you have actually questions that that are mandated that you ask and you follow. And as you said, how they answer it depends on which way they go. Again, it's just to help them and to help the first responder, whether it's the deputy or EMS or the firefighter. Correct, and again, it's to obtain information and ask questions to make sure that we're giving the best, best health care to the caller or the patient, and obviously provide the most information we can to the emergency responders before they arrive on scene. Because we don't know, you know, emergency responders don't know what equipment or what exactly is needed or if they need an additional uh, personnel to show up for a call. So it helps us to provide all the questions or answers to the questions that are needed. Yeah, because uh, again, the deputies are wanting the answers before they get there and trying to get it and, and the emotions run high and this is what makes the job of a, of, a, of a communication specialist like this so difficult because, you know, they're, they're trying to answer so many things with so many different people on both sides of the telephone. Uh, well, of course, one be the telephone, one be in the, the dispatch mic. You know, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's confusing. And then you have to, you know, cause the, typically the intake person is not going to be the one dispatching it. Correct. You know, so then you have to get the information into the system, you know, because you don't want to stand them up and screaming across a, a big room to give them the information. But uh, sometimes on these hot things, I'm sure that still, still happens. It goes back to old school sometimes. Yes, it does. And our call takers, like I said, if they're, they're putting in the information in the screen, which is being filtered to our dispatchers who talk to the field units, and all that information is being sent to the field units as well, whatever the call taker puts in. And yes, there have been times when communications or if we're all busy and everybody's tied up on a call, yeah, they might have to get up and, and yell the information across the, across the room. Our supervisors are in the dead center of the room, so they kind of communicate that between each other, our fire EMS and our law enforcement supervisors. And uh, yeah, there could be times when that, that stress level in here gets that high, yes. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that's only during those, those rare times when you have an officer involved shooting or some kind of violent crime in progress where emotions, you know, are, are, are running high because these these are men and women that are husbands, their wives, you know, they have kids, they have grandkids, they have relatives, and, and sometimes it really hits them personally. Absolutely. And again, like I was saying, not knowing the outcome of a call, they take that home with them. You know, they don't know if they saved a life or not. And uh, we have some of our, you know, emergency personnel that'll call back and let us know, you know, the outcome of a patient. But again, you don't know after you've given chest compressions for 30 minutes over the phone to somebody uh, whether or not you saved that person's life. Because like I said, once emergency personnel gets on scene, we hang up the call and get ready for the next one. And that's the other issue is, I mean, once you hang up one, you're on another call. Yeah, it's just constantly going on. And uh, well, we appreciate all that you do for, for, for Polk County. Thank you for, for sharing today. Uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, the many good things that you and your personnel do here, Kurt. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's going to do it for this edition of Crime Stoppers. Keep in mind, Heartland Crime Stoppers is an organization that helps law enforcement solve crimes through anonymous tips and monetary rewards. It encourages a cooperative partnership between law enforcement, the media, and the community to ensure security and enhance our quality of life here in Polk County. For more information, you can check us out on the web at heartlandcrimestoppers.com or follow us on Facebook at Heartland Crime Stoppers Florida. Until next time, keep in mind, it's a crime and you can help make sure they don't get away with it.